And so the point is, it's, you know, if we find out that a kid in foster care is being hit, we can get that kid out of there in a minute. But if we find out that the kid in foster care, the foster parent is tell, telling the kid that they're going to throw them out if they don't want to pay, we tend not to respond in the same way. Now, I, I understand that there's a shortage of foster homes and that that's always a problem, but I'm just wanting you to be alert to the fact that psychological safety is as significant for the kid as physical safety. So if a kid is feeling threatened psychologically, they're going to have problems healing in that home, even if you don't see the home as a dangerous one. Okay. And in general, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but many of the behaviors, the most challenging behaviors that kids exhibit are attempts to make them feel safe. And we talked about this earlier, whether it's running away, whether it's fighting back, whether it's being promiscuous. A lot of the behaviors are about safety seeking. So, the Blaustein and Kinneberg said, trauma-informed care that addresses <coughs> attachment and safety involves these things. That is, caregiver affect management, we'll talk about that, Caregiver attunement, we'll talk about that. Consistency and routines and rituals. That if you do these things, over time the kid's sense of safety will increase and their ability to trust, which is what we're talking about that with respect to attachment, will develop. And it will take a while. So what is caregiver affect uh, management? Well, what this is, is they have to learn how to manage their own reactions. Guess what? The behavior these kids engage in triggers the caregivers, right? <laughs> the caregivers get angry. The caregivers want to get rid of the kid. The caregivers want to ignore the kid. The caregivers disconnect. The caregivers are having problems with their own feelings because the kids are engaging in behaviors that are highly problematic. Well, caregivers need to learn how to deal with that. So, and this includes the workers, right? This includes the case managers, this includes the teachers, not just the foster parents. Teachers we know can be highly triggered. Can DCPP workers be triggered? Yes, <laughs> we can all be triggered. Therapists can be triggered. There's not a person in the world who can't be triggered. And, if, and there are certain people who really know what to do to push your buttons. And, and pushing buttons, by the way, deliberately pushing buttons, is a way for kids to feel some control, believe it or not, even if the reaction they get is a very negative one, because then they feel in control of what happens. These kids who've never been in control. So this business about pushing buttons is huge. So we say caregivers need to identify difficult situations and their own triggers. They need to be, I'm putting this in there, they need to be particularly aware of stereotypes and reactions based on race, gender, and other categories. Now, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just put this out there, I don't know whether, you know, I don't have time to go through this, but there's a whole discussion that takes place in undoing racism and other settings that I've been in about how anger expressed by blacks is viewed versus anger expressed by whites. You know, and whether a black person can make the same kind of a, even assertive statement with not, without being seen as the angry black man or the angry black woman. You know, so this is a real issue because if you have a caregiver, a teacher, a whoever it is, who's viewing the child through a racial lens, through a gender lens, with certain kinds of expectations or what be, about what behaviors are, their own reactions are going to be much greater than if they're not viewing it that way. And, and listen to me though, I want to be clear, I'm not saying only white people can view kids through a, a gender racial lens, okay? That black people can view black kids through a race lens as well and make certain kinds of assumptions about the kid based on race, okay? So I, 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 this is a very important issue. People have to notice their own reactions. You know, this goes back to the same problems that kids have. You can have an increasing level of arousal and not even know that you're, you're really getting angry until you're off the wall. We need to help people normalize the fact that they have reactions. 
we are all going to have reactions to kids, especially if they're pushing buttons. So the question is, where do we go when we have that feeling, when we get angry, when we want to disconnect, when we want to, you know, come back in some way? It can't be at the kid. We need to have ways to manage that. So we need to develop structures and venues in which those reactions can be processed, can be discussed, so that we get help with that. And we need to develop our own skill building and coping strategies and how we cope with our own tension when we're interacting with kids. Now again, you know, I, I'd be interested if CCPP wants to, if staff wants to say anything, but I feel that the division has not always been tremendously open to the processing by staff of their own reactions to events. That often, I, 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 when I taught here, I used to hear from workers that, you know, that it was expected that you just stuff it. Well, there's a lot of stuff to stuff. And there's only so much room to stuff it in, you know. <laughs> and after a while, it's going to start pouring out the holes. So I think we, you know, this is really, again, if we, we know we're, we're dealing with kids who are traumatized, we know they're going to push our buttons, we need to have structures in which we can learn how to cope with this. And it's going to be an ongoing thing. It's not like you learn how to cope today and that lasts for the next 40 years. It's not like that. This is an ongoing process. So we talk about caregiver affect management. I, another group that I think gets no support around this stuff is teachers. So I mean, and they're dealing with it all the time too. And frankly, I don't think what the parents do either, really. So I mean, all these groups that are dealing with this on a regular basis are not getting the kind of support they need. Then we talk about caregiver attunement. So not only do you have to manage your own reactions, but then you have to accurately and empathically read the kid's emotional cues and respond to those rather than the behaviors. Now this is, you can only do this if you're managing your own affect. Yeah, I, I can tell you that. You can't do this if you're totally caught up with your own reactions. But what we're talking about is understanding the child's hypervigilance and the resulting reaction. So if the child reacts with alarm and runs out of the house because you scowled them, the response to that can't be punishment because they left the house without permission. Or at least that, that shouldn't be the first response. What should be, you don't have to outline exactly what you do, but what is it that we want a foster parent to do if a kid bolts out of the house because you scowled them? What do we, when they see the kid the next time, what is it that we want them to do? Hmm? Inquire, but let me just warn you, okay, that most of these kids, the whole issue is that they don't, they're not very good at talking about their feelings. That's the whole problem, okay, <laughs> that, that they're reactive behaviorally. And you ask them what's going on, they can't necessarily tell you. All right, so while inquiry would seem like a good thing to do, I will tell you that it often just, makes kids more frustrated. Cookies and milk. Hmm? <laughs> cookies and milk. Cookies and milk. Okay. Now, why do you say cookies and milk? I'm just saying something warm and comforting. Absolutely. Welcome I'm not angry at you. Right. Come on in. Let's settle down. And in fact, that's a big piece, but that's not the only piece. That's actually more about um, helping kids de-escalate. This is about attunement. This means reading what the behavior means and trying to respond to that rather than responding out of your own need. So, what else? Well, what do we, why do we think a kid could bolt out of the house? Hmm? Fear, anger, some high level of distress, right? That's what would make somebody bolt out of the house, right? I mean, I think we can pretty well say that, right? So, this may be like a really stupid thing that I'm going to say. Maybe you all thought of it, you thought it was too stupid to say. But I think it's okay to say something like, I can imagine you were very distressed or upset that you left the house like that. It's simply a response that verbalizes what that feeling was underneath the behavior. Because our tendency is to go right for the behavior. You know it's against the rule to run out of the house like that. 
You know you're not supposed to do that. We've already had these discussions, right? And, and the tendency to go for the behavior skips right over what the emotion that drove that behavior was. So we're saying we want people to recognize what the meaning of the behavior is and to reflect that in some way. And that's what we talk about reflective listening, whether it's listening actually to words spoken or to behavior that's exhibited. To try to state back to the kid, it seems to me you were pretty upset with that you left the house. That's a reflective statement. People understand what I'm saying? That, that and the cookies.